It is different, isn't it? All right, you're on. Good evening. Welcome to our Sunday night service here at Brian Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Cowardin. Uh, I want to greet you. I hope you all had a great day in the Lord. We trust that you did. So, staying pretty close to home, I guess. Most everyone seems to be. Uh, our church family seems to be okay. We stay in contact with them uh, throughout the week. And so far, we have no one that has any symptoms whatsoever of the virus. But we're all trying to be cautious, follow our president's direction, and uh, do what we need to do. But we're glad you're here tonight. We pr appreciate you tuning in. We hope you tuned in this morning. Saw uh, Brother Aaron's Bible class, tremendous class, and then the preaching of God's Word. And I hope that you could pull, pull that up on the Internet and, and watch it. Maybe you'll invite others next week. That would be a blessing. Before we start the service tonight, I want to uh, uh, announce Brother Don Moore, who I announced this morning. Brother Don is now home from the hospital. Uh, <laughs> I saw a picture of him. Uh, he, he really, we need to really pray for him. Uh, pray that it'll be a quick healing, that, that he will heal quickly. Uh, and, but I know Miss Pat's glad to have him home, and we are too. And I know that some of you were, were praying for him today. Well, tonight, uh, we are honored to have one of our men Brother Jan Linderman, he's our treasurer, but he has pastored in Michigan. He has been interim pastor in uh, Tennessee. No, Illinois. Illinois. Illinois, okay. And he's a great blessing to our church, and I mean that. Uh, we appreciate him. Uh, he's a help to me and a help to the church, and, and he's doing a great job, interim treasurer of the church, and we're just being blessed uh, by that. But we're glad you're here. and. Just uh, oh, oh, one other thing, Betty is doing well. Uh, she wasn't hurt in the fall. Uh, she did bang up her elbow pretty bad, but we're doctoring that at home rather than try to get to the hospital and have it sewed up. We'll watch it. If something develops, we will, of course, take care of that. But she sends her love to everybody, and she is doing well. It, it was not a serious fall, uh, but... Anyway, she's she's doing doing good tonight. So anyway, we're glad you're tuned in to us, and we hope and pray that you'll get a blessing from the service. Brother Jan, if you'll come, we'll turn it over to you, and open your Bibles if you have it. If not, sit back and listen to the Word of God. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> Amen. It's always a joy and a pleasure to be here, and it's always a joy and a pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, bring the Word of God to each and every one of you. I'm looking around, and I see that the threat of the impending rain has not impeded anybody from its attendance. So for those of you who are not here or are here, I'm glad to see you, and for those of you who are on the Internet, I hope this is a message of blessing to you. Let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are, as we have said, truly grateful for the opportunity to break the bread of life and bring forth the word of God. We ask that your hand would be upon me as the messenger. I would ask that you prepare the hearts and the ears and the lives of each and every individual that may be listening. We pray that they may be touched with the message of God and that they may know that in spite of the fact they're not physically here, they have been in the presence of God. Bless us now, Father, and be with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I have a little P.S. on the front of this message, not on the back. I, I, did, I, I did not enter into preaching this message in a, a flippant or a light manner. I never do. I believe when I'm asked to preach, I am God's man for God's time. 
I deliberated and prayed as to what God would have me to preach. And the message I'm going to bring to you was the very first message that came to my mind about a week ago. God laid it upon my heart and mind to preach this. Another message. Another message presented itself to me, but I said, no, not that one, not at this time. This is the message that God wants me to preach. And there was once somebody that said that things that are different are not the same. Pastor preached a message about five days ago, which was entitled, We Need Revival. And it came out of 2 Chronicles 7.14. Guess what? It's the very same text that God has led me to preach from. Same text, different message. God does not make mistakes, nor has he ever. So I ask you, if you're listening tonight, get out your pencils and papers, take some notes, Write in your Bibles whatever it takes to remember some of this of the message that God has laid here. I didn't know about this duplication of message until this morning. Shock of all shocks as I was reviewing what uh, was online and I listened to part of the of pastor's message and I said, that's the same message I am preaching. But it's not. It's different. But my superior technical knowledge limited me from accessing it until today. So, we will turn to 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles, and I see already I've got my Bible in 1 Chronicles, so we'll get over to 2 Chronicles 7.14. 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Historically, if you read some of the background behind this particular verse of Scripture, um, the original promise that is being repeated here is found in 2 Chronicles 6, 9 and the first part of chapter 7. Now sometime later, after Solomon had completed his temple and built his home, his palace, God appears to him another time, a second time. And God reaffirms that very same promise to him that he had made earlier. But he also told Solomon that there's a catch. There's a condition to this promise. It was contingent upon Israel's faithfulness. He also said that if Israel proved faithless, they would be exiled and the temple would be destroyed. So that's some of the, uh, briefly, the historical background of it. There's also a grammatical background. This is called a conditional sentence. We used to call it in school one of those if and then sentences. If this takes place, then this will happen. Or sometimes it'll be if and when. But it's considered to be what they call a type one conditional sentence. And I am not an English major, thank you. But that's a little bit of the background. Did I hear the audience say how true? <laughs> this is a conditional statement. Sometimes it's called a covenant because it is a covenant. It's an agreement between God and man. This is a conditional one. God says, if you do these things, then I will promise you this. So this is a conditional statement. And, this is, and these are the if clauses of that statement. And it begins with evidence of a godly possession. If my people, my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. My people. The Hebrew here is ami, A-M-M-I, ami, meaning my people. 
That may mean nothing to you. I'm not a Hebrew scholar either. In fact, I'm a master of no trade, it appears sometimes. But this is a term maybe you are more familiar with if you look at it in a different scenario, different light. More famously is the word lo-ami, which means not of my people. And this was a name that was given to Hosea's prophet, or excuse me, the prophet Hosea's second son. He was called not of my people. Good name study, a good study, a really good study about names you can find in Hosea chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. There's a story just in the names themselves. And this is a good figurative name rightfully given to the people of God, rightfully given to Israel. Lo ami, my people. By extension, this name aptly can be applied to the church. The children of God, the people of God that we find in the New Testament. Romans chapter 1 verses 9 to uh, excuse me, chapter 9, verses 24 to 26, tell us this. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. As he had said also in O.C., which is Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not my beloved. And it came to pass that in that place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Romans chapter 9, verses 24 to 26. We need to read on your own Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, and also chapter 23. It expands on this concept. You know what, folks? I'm so glad I'm so glad that I'm part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain and cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod, for I'm a part of the family of God. That's a song from Bill Gaither. Some of you like him, some of you don't, but that's the words from that song, and I thought they were appropriate. I ask you now, I ask you, can you claim, can you claim membership? Can you claim fellowship? Can you claim kinship in the family of God? Can you call them brothers and sisters? Do you know the Jesus as your brother and as your savior? My people which are called by my name. I'm glad to be called by his name. I'm glad to be called by his name. His name is wonderful. The prophet Isaiah said his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. Let me ask you, let me ask you, are you glad tonight that you can be counted among his people? Are you glad tonight that you can be called by his name, Christian, a follower of the way? Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And I say to you, if you and I are seeking revival for our individual person or our churches or our nations, we need to have a change in attitude. We need to have a change in attitude. That's what the next part is. There needs to be a Godward change in our attitude. We need to have an attitude adjustment. Charles Finney in the lecture said once, a revival is nothing else than a new beginning of obedience to God. I support Pastor Coward. I want to see revival for this church. 
I want to see revival for each and every one of us as individuals. I want to see revival for this nation. And if we don't see revival, we may see a continuing wrath of God. If you're longing for relief from this, this so-called pandemic, which it is, this COVID-19, this generator of fear, paranoia, anxiety and frustration and sickness and yes, even death. If you're looking for relief from that, then I think you need to be looking to God. I think you need to be looking for what God wants from us. And that's an attitude adjustment. We need to change our ways. You know, the root of the problem for this country is that we need to repent of our wickedness before God. The radical political actions and the multi-trillion dollar national debts will not solve the problem of America. The fundamental issue in America is her terrible sin against God. The greatest pandemic in this nation and, and on the face of this earth is not the pandemic of COVID-19, but it's the pandemic of sin. It's a sin that was inherited from our first father, Adam. And the mortality rate is 100%. Praise, praise God, praise God. There's a cure. You may have freedom from this fatal virus called sin, but only healing can come through the, for the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son. For God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not works, lest any man should boast. Romans 10, 9 and 10 tells us that if you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. God requires a change of our attitude. Four things God wants us to know. Four things that God wants us to do before he'll honor his promise to us. The scripture says that, first of all, we should humble ourselves. That's humility. Humble ourselves. My people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. Humble themselves. Humility. That's the ability to be without pride or arrogance. And it's a premium characteristic that all who are call and claim the name of Jesus Christ should possess. James 4.10 says we should humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. Proverbs 22.4 tells us by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches honor, and life. Yes, we need to humble ourselves. And it goes on, it says, we shall humble ourselves and what? Pray. Humble ourselves and pray. That's talking about a fervent supplication to God. James 5, 16 says, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. First Thessalonians says in 5, 17, Pray without ceasing. Prayer is the key that unlocks all the storehouses of God's infinite grace and power. All that God is 
And all that God has is at the disposal of prayer. We've got to use the key. We must use the key. Prayer can do anything that God can do. And God is omnipotent, so God can do anything. C.H. Spurgeon said, what wonders prayer has wrought. The word of God teems with its marvelous deeds. Believer, thou hast a mighty engine in thy hand. Use it well, use it constantly, use it with faith. And thou shalt surely be benefactor to thy brethren. I think we have one of the finest groups of ladies and men in this church. We have some mighty prayer warriors here. And we, as a family, and we as a church, I'm sure, are thankful for the prayers that go up for our families, our friends, our loved ones, and the lost ones. So I say to the prayer warriors, maintain, continue, keep up the good work. We need all the prayers we can get. The devil is busy. He's working to destroy the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will not do it. We know who the victor is, but he's still busy. He's still busy. There's nothing like the power of prevailing prayer. Abraham pled for the preservation of Sodom when he said, if but just five remain, will you not destroy Sodom? Jacob wrestled with God in the stillness of the night for a blessing. Moses stood in the breach for the people and pled for them. Hannah was intoxicated with sorrow as she petitioned for a child. David was heartbroken with remorse and grief concerning his sins with Bathsheba. Jesus sweat great drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane as he agonized to avoid what he knew he must do shed his blood upon the cross of Calvary. I tell you, that's the power of prayer which will prevail. That's the kind of prayer that turns mortals into men of power. That's the kind of prayer that brings fire out of heaven. That's the kind of prayer that brings the rain. That's the kind of prayer that brings life, and it brings God. shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Did you ever, when you really wanted to get a point across to your wife, did you ever just kind of take her by the face and right close to her and say, honey, listen to me. I'm trying to tell you something. Did you ever do that? I don't know. I, I never have. I'm scared to, I think. I'm not sure. But... Uh, you want to see them. You want to look at them face to face. You want them to see your eyes. You want to see. Once somebody said that the eyes are the window to the soul. I want to see in that window. I want to know who's there. Seek my face. I, I'll tell you a story. Quick story. Maybe a stupid story. I don't know. I promised my dog I'd tell him a story. My dog, when he doesn't want to pay attention to you, he turns his back on you. And I don't care what you say to him or what you promise him, he's not going to listen. But when it's his turn, he seeks out your face. If it's food he wants from that table, he's sitting right there looking at you. My wife's the biggest sucker of all on that one. She gives in to him every time. And he knows it. 
but he knows if he can see her face to face and, and you can see the pleading in his eyes, he knows he's going to get what he's after. God wants to see you face to face. God wants to see you face to face. And then the fourth point, the first three were this. First of all, we need to humble ourselves. Second of all, we need to pray. Third of all, we need to seek the face of God. And fourthly, we need to turn from our wicked ways. That is repentance. That is repentance, my friends. Basically, repentance is just exactly that, turning away. Turning away from what? Turning away from sin and turning towards God. It involves a certain degree of regret and remorse. Yes, it does. But it's not just regret and remorse. Regret's a part of it, yes. But there's more. There's more. There's a change of direction that's required. you got to change your direction. No longer do you desire the ways of sin, but you truly seek out the will and the ways of God. Repentance, yes, displays a true sorrow for sin. That's true. Repentance brings a new mind, not just a change in your world that's around about you, not your worldview, <coughs> not your philosophy, but a new Godward allegiance, a new attitude towards God, and a new lifestyle. If any man be in Christ, the scripture says he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. True repentance is a product of true faith. Not superficialism and not easy believism. True repentance leads to forgiveness of sins. True repentance will entirely and completely change you. The bias of your soul will be changed. Your attitude will be changed. You will be delightful in God and in Christ and in his laws and in his people. Now, those are the conditions that God is expecting from us if we want to see change. That's what he wants to see. We've looked at the if clauses. If you do this, if you do that, then... Will I hear from heaven? Some of us perhaps don't possess the, uh, the good ability to hear. Some of us have a problem hearing. We know that. I do on occasion. My wife calls it uh, selective hearing. I've been accused of that. God has ears. God has ears. He can hear, and he does hear. Yeah. Psalms 4, 3 says, But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. Psalms 55, 17 says, Evening and morning and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. And also, not only does God hear, but we have an intercessor that can speak to God with words that we do not have the capability of uttering. There's one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. God forgives. He says, I will hear from heaven. And he says, I will forgive their sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We oftentimes sing the words of a familiar hymn of invitation. We all know the words. We've all heard them. We've all sung them many times over if we've been in church at all. But sometimes I don't think we hear the words. Sometimes I don't think that we ponder the truths. 
Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, come home. Earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O sinner. Come home. Oh, for the wonderful love he has promised, promised for you and for me. Though we have sinned, he has mercy and pardon, pardon for you and for me. Come home, come home, ye who are weary, Come home, earnestly, tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling, O oh sinner, come home. Romans chapter 4 verse 7 tells us, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. God tells us that he will do these things. He will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sins and he will heal our land. Not only can he heal this land and he can, not only can he do that, but he can heal you and I. Of, in our mind, in our body, and in our spirit. We are in a position that it is difficult to make an invitation. But I am imploring each and every one of you that may be listening to this Transmission. If you have not found, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, now is the accepted time. Now is the day and now is the hour. Amen. Now I ask you personally, I can't, I can't be here to hear your testimony. If you're close and you're near, you may come when the churches are back in service. We'll be glad to deal with you. We want you to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. To know him is to know everlasting life. To know him is to know eternity. That is free from the pain and the sorrow and the agony that's found in hell. We read this verse. Second Chronicles chapter 4, verse 17. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. As we read this and we apply it to Israel, we ought to also realize that God desires these same traits for you and I. Those who wish to know fully the blessings of God must humble themselves and turn from their sin. And they must willingly yield themselves to God as they seek his face. When this is done, God's blessings will be received. And this is true of nations as well as individuals. Let's pray. Father, 
This was your message. Surely not mine. I'm only the one that brings it. We ask now that your spirit would move among us everywhere. In our homes, wherever we might be. In the hospitals, wherever it is. Father, your spirit, I ask it to move. I ask it to speak to hearts and lives. I ask to speak to them about Jesus Christ. Whom to know is to have life eternal. We pray for these people. We pray they might seek your face. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jan. What a tremendous, uplifting, and blessed message tonight. It really, amen. Praise God. We want you all to have a great week. Be careful. Be safe. Be cautious. Uh, we speak to our people on the Facebook each day through a little note that we write. And I always try to encourage them to do three things. Stay close to God. Stay in God's Word and pray. Until we can meet you again by internet. And, but we're praying for the day that we can gather together in God's house as God wants us to do. And so uh, we'll be praying for you this week. And we're available, the church is available, if we could help anybody at any time. Uh, we will do everything we can. We'll be careful. We'll be cautious to keep everybody safe. But let me just also remind this, and we'll we'll close. <clears throat> uh, several of the folk have been responding real great uh, in sending their tithes and their offerings and the mission offering. And we've been encouraging them to do that uh, every day in the note that we write. And the reason for that is two, two reasons. Even though we're shut down right now, the church's expenses go on. But more than that, our missionaries are dependent on it. That's even to me more important. I mean, you know, we could, we could go without electricity for a while, uh, especially when nobody's here. <laughs> uh, and that type of thing. But our missionaries are dependent. And let me say to you tonight, they are facing a lot more tribulation in this mess than we are. They are some, many of them are suffering. You have no idea. I mean, I've got a comfortable home I can go to and withdraw. But we've got missionaries around the world that will be suffering tremendous because of this virus. So let just encourage you, send them to me, 20357 Peachland Boulevard, 33954, uh, and uh, we'll see that Brother Jan gets them. But it is important that you be faithful, and we trust that you will. Thank you for listening in tonight. We uh, look forward to the day that we can be together. Thank you again, Brother Jan for a tremendous message. God bless you, and good night.